All right, hi students. Uh, this lecture is over chapter 13, which is uh, on heat transfer. All right, so um, in chapter 12, we, uh, uh, we, we started our theory of thermal physics. And in chapter 12, we learned quite a bit. In chapter 12, um, we discussed how basically the why uh, heat, uh, of the heat transfer. So in thermal physics, we discuss, so again, chapter 12 is our first chapter in thermal physics. Uh, in chapter 12, You know, on the uh, topics of temperature and heat, we discussed observations of temperature change. and its effects on, on materials. You know, particularly, you may see what's called thermal expansion or contraction. You may also see phase changes. And all of this was discussed in the last video, the one over, um, I'm just kind of recapping. Okay, you may have phase changes. All right, now, so again, you know, just like with our development of mechanics, in mechanics, we start talking about, what do we start talking about? We start talking about what we can observe, and then finally, we were able to employ the laws of physics and develop the theory of mechanics. Well, here we're doing the same, same kind of a, a method. We're beginning to observe and observation in the, in the most basic tangible sense for thermal systems is taking a temperature. That's how you, that's, that's, that's the, that is how you, um, um, the, you know, the basic uh, measurement you could possibly do in a thermal system. And then you realize that we have this, uh, indicator called temperature, which by the way, as I, as I said, and I'll prove it in the next chapter, is, a, is the uh, average kinetic energy of the constituents of which the substance is made. But this temperature, um, uh, essentially when, you, when the temperature changes, then effects like expansion and contraction of the object also, it may, it may even change phase. It may go from a solid phase, let's say it could melt into a liquid phase or maybe it's in a liquid phase, it might, it might evaporate into a gaseous phase. So all of this could possibly happen. Now, we ask the why questions in physics. We say, well, okay, well, we see this temperature change. Why does temperature change? The answer to that is heat transfer. Now, heat is one of those many words in science that gets used a lot in the vernacular, and and uh, generally speaking, the uh, you know the usual, the population doesn't really understand what it actually means. Uh, but heat is one of those words, and it, and it actually, by definition, it is an energy transfer. Well, I should say uh, spontaneous energy transfer due to 
a temperature change. All right. We usually use the letter capital Q to denote heat. And what are the units of heat? Well, it's the units of any other energy. Units of heat would be joules. In the SI system, it'd be joules. So the units of heat would be in the SI system, joules, which would be a Newton times a second. Or, you know, we, uh, we typically will use other systems. For instance, we may use the calorie or the kilocalorie. Our food calories are kilocalories. Uh, you know, that's the energy required to change one kilogram of water one degree Celsius, as we as we said last time. A calorie would be one gram of water, one degree Celsius. All right, we'll later talk about what's called the BTU, British Thermal Unit, which is one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. All right, so again, we'll talk about that. But we have different ways of expressing uh, energy. And it turns out that the joule is the SI unit of it. And the whole, the entire world uses SI except the United States for the most part. All right. So, and this is another example of that. Okay. Now, last time, again, I'm still talking about a recap here. Last time, last lecture, we said that we can actually calculate heat transfer. Now, if, we, if the substance remains in phase, so substance, or material remains in phase we can say that the heat transfer is given as q equals m c delta t so m is the mass of the material delta t is the temperature change And C is called the specific heat. So that's called the specific heat capacity. And it is the measure of how well a, an object will, will store heat. And it's given, it, it's uh, essentially, it is material dependent, though it depends on what substance you're talking about. And it's phase dependent. So not only can, are you gonna discuss the material, but you can also need to discuss the phase. So for instance, in the case of water, water uh, occurs, you know, in three forms. Uh, it's one of, if, if not the only, one of the only um, uh, materials on the planet that just in its regular existence occurs in all three forms. Solid water is called ice, liquid water, and then you have gaseous water is called steam. All three of these uh, phases are, forms of water are water. They're all H2O. You can imagine them being composed of all the same water molecules. Solid water has a different specific heat than liquid water and then gaseous water. You'd have three different values depending upon the phase that you're in. So as long as the phase does not change, this is the way heat transfer occurs. So essentially it is the more mass that uh, substance has, the more heat is required. Uh, the more, the greater the temperature change, the greater the heat. And there's also a sign convention for heat. And I didn't really talk about this too much last time, but this is very important, particularly when we talk about thermodynamics in chapter 15. So heat, like any thermodynamic variables is, is uh, system specific. That means it's selfish. It all depends on the system. If heat goes into the system, that means the system is gaining heat. That's positive. If heat loses, if the system loses heat, that's negative. It's kind of like you know, if if I'm a me oriented type person, if I gain money, that's positive. If I lose money, that's negative, right? If I gain you know, something that's important. That's positive. I lose it, it's negative. So in the case of heat, the system gains heat, that's considered positive. And we have to have a sign convention. 
positive. And the system loses heat. That's considered negative. Okay. You can see this in the formula. If the object is ends up being at a higher temperature when it began, we can automatically know that you know that your delta T is your T final minus T initial. So the temperature, the final temperature is larger or higher than the initial temperature, that means that delta T is going to be positive. So you know that a system that receives heat makes that system uh, at a higher temperature, makes it hotter. And on the, on the other hand, if a system loses heat, well, if, it's, if heat's going out, well, if the temperature, if the final temperature is lower, then this delta T will be negative. That means heat loss is negative. We said a little bit about that in some of the calculations we, we performed last time, talking about the sign convention for heat. But again, it's very important to, to realize whether heat is positive or negative. Heat gain is positive, heat loss is negative. Okay, very important. But, that, but this formula, it deals with a substance remaining in phase. Now, we can also have a situation where the substance actually changes phase. I'm going to read some of this stuff. All right, so now we have a situation where the substance changes phase. I.e., it goes from freeze, it goes from solid to, to liquid in the form of melting, or liquid to solid in the form of freezing, goes from liquid to gas in the form of evaporation or, or vice versa, gas to liquid in the form of condensation. Now, as I said, this is a very expensive process energetically. And it's given by the following formula. So if we're talking about, if we're talking about solid to liquid or vice versa, we say that the, the heat required for that is directly proportional to the mass, and then it's multiplied by what's called the heat of fusion. And this is a value you have to look up. Each substance has one. The very large values, generally in hundreds of kilojoules. And again, it's, you know, it's, it depends on the mass and it depends on its quantity. Essentially, as, as I said last time, the heat when, when, when an object is changing phase, the temperature does not change. All heat goes into, it's, it's kind of like a, a caterpillar in a cocoon. All heat is going into this process of metamorphosis and changing the substance from one form to another. A solid form, you know, with this very, um, very strict crystallized structure is much different than a liquid form, for instance. And so that, those breaking down of the bonds to create it was essentially a totally different looking substance. I mean, ice looks very much different than liquid water. All of that is taking place in the heat of fusion. So until all of the ice has melted, well, you start seeing a temperature change if you're going from solid liquid, or until all of the liquid water or liquid whatever has solidified, that's when you start seeing a temperature change again. So when you're having a phase change, all of the heat goes into the phase change. And then on the other on the on the other phase boundary we have the liquid to vapor. And it looks very similar. Q is M times L sub V. L sub V is called a heat of vaporization. Okay, just a recap of uh, telling you how, or telling you, you know, the, the, the way you can compute heat transfer. Okay, I told you the why, essentially. I told you, I and mean, we were answering the why questions. Why does heat transfer occur generally because of a temperature change? So if you change the temperature, that, that, that's accompanied by heat transfer, or if you put heat into or out of a system, generally, generally that's accompanied by temperature change. Okay. Now, what I did not tell you is how heat transfers. And that's a subject of this chapter. So the subject of chapter 13 
tells you how he transferred. Now, there's a, if you were to actually major in mechanical engineering or say civil engineering, you actually have to take an entire one semester course of what we're covering in this lecture. So there's a one semester course called heat transfer. You know, you are majoring in um, mechanical engineering, especially, or if you are majoring in civil engineering, you must take that class, one semester class. Now, one of my one of my bachelor's degrees is in mechanical engineering. As I told you at the beginning of the semester, I have five degrees, three bachelors, one in physics, one in mathematics, one in mechanical engineering. I have one master's degree in physics and a PhD in physics, right? Now, one of my bachelor's degrees, as I say, is mechanical engineering. So I had to take this one semester class and I, and I took my, um, I went to engineering school at Washington University in St. Louis. So St. Louis has, it's an, you know, interesting city. It has historic baseball teams. Some people have referred to the St. Louis Cardinals as one of the greatest baseball teams in Major League history. Uh, they've had Hall of Fame players like, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Lou Brock and uh, and Ozzie Smith, and you know, and you know, great, great, great players in history. Uh, Bob Gibson, uh, Mark McGuire, you, you name it, go on and on. It's a it's a city that's won many World Series. But then on the other hand, or they, have seen, they seem to have a trouble keeping a football team. And so when I went to Washington University, there was kind of a big hype you know, at, at that time because they were getting the St. Louis Rams. They were getting them from Los Angeles, California. And so everybody was thinking about football at the time. And so my advisor taught me, mechanic, taught me the uh, uh, heat transfer class. And his name was Dr. Richard Gardner, really, really great, great professor. And he was also a very witty guy. And so he decided that's the, that the semester I took, you know, he transferred, he decided to kind of start with in, in an interesting way. He kind of started with a football analogy. And I've since started the same way, a little football analogy to kind of, to kind of you know, get started with the, with the topic. All right. And so, you now again, we're talking about American football. And uh, in American football, everything gets started with the quarterback. You know, the quarterback, you have the linemen and the quarterbacks behind them. You have the receivers in the back, and they, they go out for a pass. Or, or you might have the quarterback handing the football to one of the, one of the running backs that he tries. You know, the idea, is, the idea is you try to gain yards, you know, go, going from one side of the field to the other side of the field, and you, and you get into the other, other uh, end zone, you, you score a touchdown, you get six points, right? Well, half the game the quarterback plays is the passing game. And so you look at football and you say, well, it looks like a complicated sport. There's a lot going on. However, if you break it down, you know, kind of like what we do in, in, in science, you break it down, it becomes very simple. And so, so Professor Gardner starts off by saying, well, when a quarterback throws a football, throws a pass, as they call it, Only one of three outcomes can occur. And usually, when the quarterback throws a, throws a pass, throws the football, um, only one of three uh, outcomes can occur. I usually I have a football and uh, connoisseur in class and this person usually gets it right off the bat, but no matter, no, it's about how complicated the game of football may look. When a quarterback throws a football, only one of three outcomes can happen. Either, either the quarterback throws what's called a completion, which means that uh, he throws football, one of his own guys catches it, which is what you want, or you have an incompletion, which means that he throws the football to one of his own players and the person does not catch it and nobody catches it. And on the other hand, you have the unfortunate case for the quarterback, you have what's called the interception. And that is the wrong guy catches it, 
right? So no matter how complicated, you know, you look at these, you know, football plays and the coach is drawing all these arrows and everything, right? Well, you know, and these, and these wide receivers are going out on doing routes and everything else. But when it gets all said and done, when a quarterback throws the football, you break it down, only one of three things can happen. Completion, incompletion, interception. Now you might ask, how does this have anything to do with physics or heat transfer? Well, heat transfer, heat transfer may seem complicated. But there are only three modes of heat transfer. When it's all said that heat transfer can only occur one of three ways. So heat transfer can only occur in three ways. That is conduction. Convection and radiation. That is it. So even though heat transfer seems to be complicated, you would you would kind of maybe initially assume that would have you know many, many complicated ways of occurring. When you break it down, it only occurs three possible ways. In this class, we're going in this lecture, we're going to visit each of these three ways. And that's and that's a lecture. So it's kind of a rifle shot lecture, and that we're just going to really focus on one topic, and that's a chapter. So it's a relatively short chapter. All right. Conduction, to break it down. Um, it is um heat transfer occurs. In stationary matter, okay, um, and uh, it's and, and it's by physical contact. You have to have physical touching. So in this particular case, a hotter body must physically touch a colder body. Uh, what's an example of this? Uh, a good example would, would simply be um, electric burner on a stove. In contact with a, with a pan. We'll say frying pan. Okay, so uh, so you have heat transfer that goes from the much hotter um, burner into into the uh, in, in, into the colder pan, and that hence heats up your food. Okay, you have convection. And that's heat transfer by the macroscopic movement of a fluid. So it's being carried by a moving fluid. All right, and what's an example of that? Well, an example would be weather system. or forced air furnaces. Okay, so again, in a weather system, you might say, oh, we have a warm front coming in. Well, that means that an air mass that's coming, uh, that's going to be sitting on top of you is on average has a higher has a higher temperature than the one that's currently on top of you right now. So a warm front's coming in. Essentially, heat is being carried by the macroscopic movement of this mass of air. 
Okay. And, um, you know, we have, you know, warm air from the tropics going toward the poles, colder poles, or colder air from the poles going toward the warmer tropics. So you always have this movement. You also have the easterly flow of air caused by the rotation of the earth. So there's always moving, there's always a motion of a, um, of a, of a, of, a uh, of the air in the atmosphere. Finally, you have radiation. I'm almost on a space here, but radiation is heat transferred through electromagnetic waves. Um, essentially, what's an example? Heating from the sun. And we're going. We're going to go into each one of them. So the sun, you know, the earth, the you know, sun and the earth are in um, interstellar, or, or I'm sorry, um, um, outer space. Essentially, there's there's nothing in between but the vacuum of space between the earth and the, and the and the sun. And so, their conduction and convection are not possible. The only way that the that the earth receives heat from the sun, which is the majority of the heat that we get, I mean, we have to have the sun, is through radiation, through through the uh, thermonuclear fusion processes that's occurring in the sun. Okay, so let us now revisit, or let us now visit each of these waves. We'll start with conduction. Well, we imagine with conduction, you know, you, you ask yourself the question, you know, for instance, um, you know, let's say for instance, it's a cold day, unlike, unlike now, it's a cold day and let's say you forget to turn on your heater. You get up to go to the bathroom, for instance, and an interesting phenomenon occurs. As you walk across the carpet, I mean, again, the whole floor, your whole floor is at the same temperature. You know, you're at one temperature, your floor is different temperature. You know, let's say you're walking to the bathroom, part of it is over carpeting, and part of it is over some sort of a tile floor. Well, you notice that something that's interesting is that when your feet, your bare feet, touch the carpeting, it doesn't seem so uncomfortable as when your bare feet touch the tile floor. The tile floor seems very uncomfortable. It, seems, it appears as if the floor is cold. And why is that? Well, it's because conduction heat transfer actually occurs much better with a tile floor it's a much greater conductor of heat than the carpeting. The carpeting is a, is a poorer conductor of heat. So the materials, even though the floor is all at the same temperature, the material in which you are touching, your hot foot or your hot feet versus with, the, with the colder floor, the material is either a good conductor of heat or a poor conductor of heat. And so when your body feels a discomfort when you get cold or you get, or you get too hot, it's because, you have, it's because of heat transfer. It is uncomfortable for heat to be going to be leaving your body. When that happens, you sense a, a level of discomfort. You don't like it when you know your your feet touch a, a let's say a cold tile floor. That feels very uncomfortable to you. And why that is is because your body is losing heat. And your body loses heat. The greatest places where your body loses heat is, you, is through your head and through your feet. So when it gets cold outside, you want to cover your head with a hat of some sort, and you want to cover your feet with say a some uh, thick socks or you know thicker shoes. As a, you know, it's not a it's not a sandals day when it, when it's when it's very cold outside. Okay, so so again, you notice this in your regular life. So as I say, some conductor, some materials are good conductors of heat. And some materials are poor conductors of heat. Now, as it turns out, if a material happens to be 
a good electrical conductor, it happens to also be a good thermal conductor. So let me rewrite this. So if a material, again, from your understanding of electricity, we haven't, you know, we haven't done physics two yet. Phys physics two is where we study electricity, but from your general knowledge of, of you know, of, of let's say wiring and houses and things like that, uh, if a material is a good electrical conductor, I mean, if this helps you remember, then the material is a good thermal conductor. What are good examples of good conductors? Well, anything that you know used for wiring. So good conductors like might be like metals would be a good example. Metals like copper, gold, uh, aluminum, gold, silver. Okay. Uh, another good conductor would be salt water. Humans are good conductors. You have a really, uh, you have a lot of electrolytes in your body. You conduct electricity very, very well. That's why when you're in an electrical lab, you need to be very careful of what you touch. You don't want to be touching, you don't want to touch uh, uh, open wires, for instance. And you want to be careful with your footwear. You don't want to be wearing sandals on days when you do, when you do electrical experiments. You want to wear something that has more insulated soles. That way you're, you frustrate the path of, of a current going to the earth. And so again, we are very good electrical conductors. And we're, all, and we're also very good heat conductors as well, okay? Now, if I said also that material is a poor electrical conductor, then it's also a poor thermal conductor. So material is a poor electrical conductor. Or another way of saying that it's a good insulator. Then it is a poor thermal conductor. So what might be examples of, um, of poor thermal conductors? Well, wood is one, uh, plastic, um, rubber, air, pure water. And so they're not salt water. Salt water, you know, has to, you know, there's many ions in salt, salt water. So, you know, salt, sodium chloride dissociates into sodium and chlorine. So there's a whole bunch of ions floating around salt water. And, and of course, those are free electrons. You know, we, we haven't talked about um, physics too yet, but that's a, those, that serves as a great conductor for, for electricity. Whereas pure water, you don't have any of that. So pure water, air, rubber, plastic, wood, those are all good insulators. So you put plastic, you know, protect the coatings on wires to, you know, to protect the, you know, the actual hot wire. You put, you put plastic around it or, uh, or, you know, in some cases rubber, you know, your um, thermal conductors, you know, oftentimes, you know, a good conductor, thermal conductor, you might put air between two panes of glass and that helps serve as a good thermal conductor. All right. So again, good thermal conductors and good, um, uh, this, um, you know, good, Electrical conductors make good thermal conductors. Poor electrical conductors make poor thermal conductors. So what's actually happening when when you have um, when you have uh, two bodies that are in contact with each other? So let me um, 
me get a, a picture. I think a, I think if I show you a picture is gonna be better than me drawing it. So let me uh, let me share the uh, OpenStax textbook with you. All right, and so I haven't proved this yet. You know, I'm going to I'm going to prove it for gases in uh, chapter 14. But temperature is actually a measure of the average kinetic energy of the constituents of a substance or matter. And so um, now it is not a temperature; it is a measure of it. It's different by a constant. So if an object's at a higher temperature. We understand that it has a higher average kinetic energy, which we refer to as thermal energy. If you look at this interface, on the left-hand side of the interface, you have, you have a material at a higher temperature. In the right-hand side of the interface, you have the material at a lower temperature. And so the, so the atoms or, or molecules, the constituents of, of, of the matter on the, on the uh, hot side of the interface are going at a higher average, um, thermal average kinetic energy. They'll eventually collide with some molecule or atom on the right-hand side of the interface. And this collision will cause, will cause the, the, the molecule on the, um, or the constituent on the colder side to, to, get, to have faster, uh, have higher kinetic energy, move faster. So, so essentially in a macroscopic way, you see all these collisions summing up to an overall, an overall heat conduction or, or basically a, a flux a heat flux that you'll see going from the hotter side to the to the colder side now there's a lot of complicated you know uh phenomena going on, a lot of a lot of um motions of of atoms and molecules and so that's very difficult if not impossible to get a theoretical description of this process so the best you can do is an empirical description which leads me to the next picture Now this next picture is a situation where you have a material in between two what we call reservoirs. So we have reservoirs on the far left and the far right. A substance, now I'll write this on a whiteboard in a moment. A material or, a, or an object that serves as a reservoir is an object that is so much bigger than, than the actual material that in which, um, to which it is gaining heat or losing heat that its temperature does not change. For instance, if you take your temperature or temperature of, let's say, your child with a thermometer, well, your body, it has a mass that's so much larger than the metallic head on the uh, a probe on the thermometer that, yes, your body may lose heat. However, it is not significant enough that your body would actually, uh, would actually reduce in this temperature. All right, it would not. So essentially, when, when we talk about the zeroth law of thermodynamics, a couple of chapters, or an oh, sorry, in the last chapter, we said that you know when 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 you when a, a colder op, a hot heat will flow from the hotter object to the colder object until both of them end up at the same final temperature. When we call that thermal equilibrium. Well, given that the given that the reservoir, your body is has is, has a mass is so much greater than the metallic head of the of the actual thermometer heat transfer from your body will be insignificant compared you know with its mass and so and so what happens is that the thermometer and your body end up being at the final temperature and the, so the thermometer does not actually take a temperature of your body it actually takes a temperature of itself and because of the zero flaw of thermodynamics that happens to be the same temperature as your body all right so what's happening here is as we consider these ends you know that I, I see you see these uh, end, these end slabs that are at T2 um, and T1, T2 greater than T1. We think of these as temperature reservoirs. So T, so the reservoir at uh, T2 will lose heat into this material. Now the material between the reservoirs has a cross-sectional area capital A, okay, as, as pointed out in the diagram, and it has a thickness D. All right, so we have two materials. We have two different temperatures at the endpoints. There's a heat flux that will occur through the material. It, it enters the material in a, in a, through a cross-sectional area A, where for simplicity, 
We're assuming the cross-sectional area of the, uh, A is the same throughout the entire material, and there's a thickness D between one reservoir and the other. And keeping this picture in mind, we'll formulate a, 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 fo a formula for this, or a law, if you will, for this process. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so let's kind of talk about what we just got, what we just got done seeing. I'm gonna to try to maybe redraw this picture a little bit, but you've seen the real picture, so you'll see my, my terrible artwork and you'll know what I'm trying to draw, all right? So try to draw the picture real quick. Okay, so again, on the side, <clears throat> we have these reservoirs. Okay, this would be reservoir T2. I always, I always usually write T hot. T sub H with T hot. That's, that, that makes, because otherwise people will say, well, what's, what's uh, hot versus cold, whatever. We'll just say T hot. And on the other side, so we have a object. The other side, oops, yeah, it didn't go very well. I uh, my daughter draw these. She did my third job. T cold, all right? So you imagine here that you have this interface. This area is A, this thickness is D, all right? These are what we call reservoirs. Temper these are thermal reservoirs, as I described. These are so large compared with the material that they, um, that they that yes, they lose heat, but it's not so significant that the temperature reduces, all right? Now, we tur it turns out that we, we have an empirical relationship that works very well in this, in, in for, th for conduction heat transfer. The equation is given as follows. The rate of heat transfer, all the heat transfer equations we're gonna cover in this chapter are gonna be rate equations. They'll be joules over time, which we refer to as a power. So, so many watts, if you will. So it's gonna be given as Ka times T hot minus T cold. Well, you know, call this T2, T4. So, agrees with your book. Divided by D. All right. And so, as, as I said, this is a rate of heat transfer. It's proportional to the area A. That makes sense. The greater the, the area in which the, in which the um, material is meeting the reservoir, the greater the heat would be. The greater the change in temperature, the greater the heat. That makes sense as well. And again, with the thickness, it's inverse of the thickness because, of, because the longer the heat transfer has, the more it can actually, um, you can actually have, you know, it's the longer it would take for collisions, to occur and, and you may and, and essentially the because of this distance because of the collisions you may actually end, end up getting less heat transfer across because the heat may you, you may have absorption all right now this k what is that this is the thermal conductivity it is material dependent you have to look it up.
So good conductors have a large thermal conductivity and poor conductors have a smaller thermal conductivity. All right, so thermal conductivity is, um, let's see, what are the units on it? It would be watts. So let's see, here we have, you have watts, because you have to get the watts. Uh, then you have, um, let's see, watts per, uh, per let's see here, uh, meter and per degree Celsius. You have the degree Celsius here that has to go on the bottom. You have meter squared over meters. That's going to give you a per meter. And then that goes in the bottom and you have watts that's going to be on top. Okay. All right. And so now, turns out that, um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to show you a table. You have to look up, look up these things in the table. And we'll show you that in a moment. It turns out that the HVAC community, heating, ventilation, air conditioning community, generally phys physicists like to, and you'll, you'll see this when we talk about um, from, uh, electrical resistance, for instance. A lot of times, physicists like to, like to dress up an, um, a, a process like this look like a resistance. And so in general, we, have, we like to take this D over K, we call it an R factor. We have this D over K called an R factor. That means when we can actually, in the insulation industry, we say, well, this heat transfer rate will be A, T2 minus T1 divided by R, okay? So good conductors or good insulators, that's when, what do you care about the insulation industry and you're putting insulation in a house? You care about good insulators. You don't want conductors. You want, in, you want the opposite, you want insulators. So a good insulator, if you're putting in insulation in your house, for instance, has a large R factor. So again, you don't want heat actually conducting through your house. So you actually want to dress up the equation such that and so if you look at the, you look at insulation, you'll, you'll actually look at what is called an R factor for insulation, okay? Um, R factors have interesting units. Units on an R factor, again, you know, the HVAC industry is a lot of really great, you know, units that are very, very outdated. I was very surprised. I, I had an engineering co-op job at a refrigeration company called Husband Refrigeration. They make they make refrigeration cases for supermarkets. And I was blown away by the units that are used in the industry. So for instance, an R factor, the units on an R factor, um, you know, strange as it may seem, they're foot feet squared times degrees Fahrenheit per BTU. A BTU is a British thermal unit. It is the amount of energy required. So you stay in this camera here. Uh, to raise one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. All right, so again, it's a seemingly archaic unit, but that, but when you're talking about particularly the American uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning industry, that's typically BTUs is the energy unit of choice. Not joules, not even calories or kilocalories, BTUs, the British thermal unit. All right, so again, when you do insulation, you talk about R factors. Let me do, let me, let's do a problem. I don't really have anything else to say about, well, actually, I do have one more thing to say about that law. Hang on one second. Let me, let's, let me write it down one more time and talk about it real quick. There's one more thing to say about it. Um, and it, again, it's an empirical law. Again, Q over T is KA T2 minus T1 divided by D. 
Okay, this law actually has, now it's not a law of physics like we've been discussing. It's not like Newton's law. It's a law of physics, remember, is the behavior of the universe that, that, um, that is always true that, but does not have a more primary cause. This does not stand as a law. It's a law in quotation marks, if you will. But this is what we refer to as Fourier's law. Now, as I've said in the past, France in the 1800s had an unusually um, large number of, of genius level physicists and mathematicians. And, you know, and, uh, you know they, they've had, they had Poisson, they had Laplace, they have, we talked about Pascal, Legendre, various mathematicians. The greatest one of all, and, and if you were to ask uh, you know, a physics historian, Probably the greatest one of these great French mathematicians in the 1800s was Jean Baptiste Fourier. And I try to, I speak French, I try to pronounce the French a little bit as best I can. Uh, and Americans will typically say Fourier. We see his name in the study of waves as well in this class. You know, when we talk about waves, we generally will look at a wave as a simple sine wave. You might, you know, when we look at a sine wave, we can describe the wavelength, the period, the, the, angular, uh, the, the angular frequency, and so on and so forth for a sine wave. And then you might ask yourself the question, well, that seems like an idealization. I mean, does a sine wave really describe waves in general? And, and the answer is yes, they do, because of the, the, uh, of the theorem given by, by Fourier. Fourier said that all waves are the summation of simple sine waves. And he and we and I showed you a couple of examples. I mean, I show you a couple of examples of that in the in chapter 16 and chapter 17. But again, Fourier's name appears multiple places in physics. So not only is he known for his um for for his uh, great contribution to wave theory, he's also the this particular heat conduction law is named after him, Fourier's law. All right. And so just to you know, give you a little bit of a taste of history. Okay, now I'm gonna work a problem. I'm gonna do OpenStax 14.30. Okay. Um, it says calculate a rate of heat conduction. through house walls. That are 13.0 centimeters thick. And have an average thermal conductivity twice that of glass wool. Assume that there are no windows or doors. <clears throat> the surface area of the walls One hundred and twenty meters squared and 
and their surface is at 18.0 degrees Celsius. While their outside surface is at five degrees Celsius, it means five degrees Celsius outside. Please, problem's pretty long. Okay. And then part B, which I'll write in a minute, is going to, is going to say uh, how many one kilowatt heaters would be needed to balance the heat, heat transfer due to conduction. Okay, so, so essentially you have heat transfer that's going to be leaving the house due to conduction. All right, so what do we know? Calculate the rate of heat transfer, uh, heat conduction through house walls that are 13.0 centimeters thick, that's your D in your equation, have an average thermal conductivity twice at a glass wall. We got to look that up. Assume that there are no windows or doors. Okay, so we want everything to be the same material. The surface area of the walls is 120 meters squared, and their surface during the inside temperature will be 18 degrees Celsius, and the outside temperature, five degrees Celsius. All right. One thing I did not cover a moment ago was looking up heat transfer coefficients. So let's just do that real quick, and then we'll, we'll take a look. So we want to find out twice at a glass wall, for instance. All right. So, so how do we do this? So I'm going to share again. So a lot of thermal physics, you end up having to look up a lot of a lot of things. All right, and so here we are. So let's see here. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Is that table? There it is. All right. So your book will have a similar type of a table. So all you do is you look at the substance and you look at the corresponding thermal conductivity. Again, it's K given as joules per, well, joules per second meter degree Celsius. I wrote watts per meter degree Celsius. I mean, you can think of it as officially it's joules per second meter degree Celsius. That's, a, that's another way of expressing the thermal conductivity, all right? Can you, get, look at, you can look at the equation to kind of in, in determine what the what the uh, what the unit should be. So you have uh, various thermal, thermal conductivities. You notice that the metals have higher values than say other ones. So look at the, what you consider really good conductors like copper, silver, gold. They have the largest values. As you go further down, when you look at when you look at um, um, water, for instance, they're talking about their pure water. You know, quite low. And you look at stuff like uh, wool, glass wool, air, styrofoam. You know, the styrofoam cups you use for cold coffee. Again, those have very small values. So again, the larger the value of the, of the thermal conductivity, the greater you know the greater conductor it is. So the worse value, the greater uh, the the it makes for a bad conductor, or i.e. a good insulator. You know, styrofoam is a very good insulator because it has a very low thermal conductivity. Okay, so we look at glass wall, we see 0 0.042. All right, so we'll kind of keep note of that. That's again, that's a value you have to look up. All right, and so let me uh, erase the uh, board here and work the problem. A lot of times in these heat transfer problems, the, the actual problem statement is bigger than the actual problem itself when you work it out. So, you know, so this is not a very big problem to work out. All right, so here we go, we're gonna erase this. So there's nothing else for me to say about the conduct conduction equation because it is a empirical equation. It's nothing for me to derive. I cannot derive it from first principle. Okay, going from the English algebra translation, what do we, what do we know from what we just read? Well, we know the thickness of the walls of a given wall is going to be 0 0.13 meters. Thickness of wall. So on one side of the wall, there's just one wall, 
Again, there's a whole bunch of walls in the house, right? One side of the wall, we're gonna have a temperature T2 and the other side, the inside of temperature T1. Heat will flow through the wall, right? So heat's flowing. And, and this wall has, a, these walls have a certain thing, all right? Now there's a whole bunch of these walls. So you add up all of these walls, you'll get the, you'll get the overall area, right? The so we find out, <clears throat> so the area, the whole area of the house, you know, adding up all these walls, no windows or doors, area of the house, adding all these walls up, you have a total area of, you know, outside, outside, uh, um, um, we say reservoir and the inside reservoir, total area, um, cross or the area in which the, which the reservoir, you know, which the material meets each of the reservoirs will be A equals 120 meters squared. Okay, <clears throat> we're told the thermal conductivity is, is twice that of glass wall. So we look up glass wall. It has um, thermal conductivity 0 0.042 joules per second uh, meter degree Celsius. Funky units. So the thermal conductivity will be um, 0 0.084 joules per second meter degree Celsius. What else we need to know the, in the 40 equation? Well, we need, we need to know the temperature. So T2 is 5.00 degrees Celsius. T1 is 18.0 degrees Celsius. These are all the temperature, everything we need to know. What is the formula? Fourier's law is Q over T is equal to Ka, uh, T2 minus T1 divided by D, all right? So we can put that in there so I can put all this. I have 0 0.042 joules per second meter degree Celsius, okay? Area of 120 meters squared. Then I have, uh, let's see, T2, I have five degrees Celsius minus 18 degrees Celsius. I'm, keep, I'm taking off the decimals to kind of save space. There really are decimals in the zeros after that. Uh, divided by the thickness of 0 0.13 meters. That's all I have to do. I have a tailor-made equation. Okay, what I get from that, it's all said and done, I'm going to erase these values here now. I do this calculation. It's really all there is to finishing transfer is finding ways to utilize this Fourier's law. When I do this, I plug it all in. I find that Q over T <clears throat> is going to be negative 1,008 watts. It is negative. You can see that a couple of ways. You see that you're, talking, you're doing 5 minus 18. That's going to give you a negative number. It's mm -hmm. negative because that means that's Negative means heat loss. Your system's inside your house, and so you're losing heat. You're considering this is a, is a heat loss. And that's what, that's what the negative sign means. Part B is quite simple. It says how many one kilowatt heaters uh, will be required to make up for this loss? Well, you just need one kilowatt heater, right? A thousand watts is a kilowatt. You only need one kilowatt heater. So, so essentially, um, one one kilowatt heater is required to compensate for this heat loss. Okay, and that's really all there is to conduction. You have to have bodies physically touching. A hot body and a cold body must physically touch for heat transfer to occur via conduction, okay? Now, the second mode of heat transfer is convection. Let's talk about that next.
So remind ourselves, convection is heat transfer through the macroscopic movement. of a fluid. And as I said, weather systems, some ovens work through convection, uh, force air furnaces work through convection. You're essentially taking uh, a mass of fluid that has a higher, uh, uh, has a, um, at a higher temperature than say another mass of fluid or, or a surrounding area and heat transfer occurs. And as this fluid moves around, let's say, for instance, if you're, you know, you, you say, oh, a, a warm front's coming in. Well, it means that, you know, that right now the air above you is at a certain temperature. However, a warm front essentially means that air that's moving to replace the air that's currently above you or, on, or all around you, that air is going to be at a higher average temperature. That air is being, that air is on average is a higher temperature. The heat is being carried through this, ma this mass flow of air. Okay. Now, the problem with convection. So the problem with convection is, the problem with convection is that in all but very rare cases or very specific cases, The air or the, the fluid performs turbulent mixing. We as a scientific community do not understand turbulence. As I said, to do understand turbulence, we need to understand how to solve what are called the Navier-Stokes equations. We do not know how to do that. Not even Einstein understood turbulence, all right? And so that's the issue, is it, this is a very, very difficult, if not impossible, problem. All right, so we do not, so essentially, we do not understand turbulence. We, as a scientific community, do not understand turbulence. As I've said earlier, physics is generally governed by what are called differential equations. Th those are equations in which all the, the various terms involved or different orders will be called derivatives. All right, and um, which are fancy ways of saying slopes in calculus. All right, so we would need to solve the equations, the Navier-Stokes Navier equations which are the differential equations for fluid flow, or say fluid mechanics, if you will. Fluid mechanics is involved, we talked about fluid mechanics already, fluid mechanics is involved here because, because the heat is being carried by a moving fluid. So again, we're seeing that physics is always intertwined. People ask me sometimes, uh, is, are, 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 is, uh, is the final exam comprehensive? And I say, well, no, not officially comprehensive, but Physics by its very nature is comprehensive, right? Because it's always borrowing from what you've already done. So again, we talked about fluid mechanics. That's chapter 11. Well, here we are again talking about fluid mechanics. <clears throat> All right. And so these equations right now are unsolved. 
In fact, if you can solve them, you get a million dollars. One mm -hmm. megabuck, megabucks, all right? So that's how important they are, if you can solve them. And you probably get a Nobel Prize on top of everything else, all right? And so, so essentially, that's what's needed. So we cannot do convection heat transfer from a theoretical perspective. It's very, very difficult to do. What do people who do heat transfer for a living, what do they do? What do scientists who study this, how they do something? How, what, what do they do? So scientists and engineers, who study convection heat transfer, try to formulate the problem to look like Fourier's law. Their uh, way of looking at it is the following. They would write an equation looking like this. Q over T is H A times T2 minus T1. Now, the name of the game for convection heat transfer is to find H. All the other variables are the same as what, they, what you saw before. H is called the heat transfer coefficient, uh, the convective heat transfer coefficient. Through so some way or another, if I can find H, then I can do this problem. Now, finding H is really, really hard. Okay? Trying to find a convective heat transfer coefficient is very difficult to do. And so what, so what do scientists do? All right, so we gotta find H. If we can find H, we can find, we can solve a convective heat transfer problem. So to find H, Scientists set up experiments. They set up convective flow experiments. For various scenarios. They then employ uh, mathematical correlation. Some of them are very, very ugly. To fit the data and calculate H. Now, when I say ugly, I mean really ugly. You can have a fraction of two different terms added together and they may, they may have uh, fractional powers and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just whatever equation you can find that can somehow give you a correlation that you can use to calculate H. There's no rhyme or reason why the correlation looks the way it does. And so they'll have, you know, for instance, they might have an experiment where they might say, um, you know, they'll do an experiment where they'll have uh, a heated cylinder and cross flow. So maybe a heated cylinder in cross flow. So you might have a cylinder some sort of length, and then it's under some sort of a cross flow of, of a fluid. 
and you do that experiment and they, and they give you some way of calculating H, or you might have a sphere in cross flow. Instead of having a cylinder, you have a sphere, some radius. And again, you have cross flow, some sort of flowing fluid. And you, as a scientist, have to try to figure out of all the different experiments, all the different data that's out there, how can you best match up your experiment to one of the official ones that have been done? Or you might have to go off and do, a, and do an experiment yourself. But what you do is you just kind of say, well, what is, what is this like? Is this, this, is like a, this is like a cylinder in cross flow, right? Or this is like a sphere in cross flow. And, and you have to play games like that in order to be able to try to get H. So the reality is, Convection transfer is well beyond the scope of this class. We're not even going to attempt it. It's well beyond the scope of university physics research. It's pretty much well beyond the scope of any area of physics, unless you are particularly focusing on a course in heat transfer. That's the only time you're going to actually get into something like this, is if you're actually discussing heat transfer as a separate topic, as a separate course. Generally speaking, no physics class will touch it. It's too difficult. All right. So what do you do in this case, like in the, in the, in the level of this class? Well, you just look at gross, uh, you know, behavior. So I'm going to kind of go over an example. I'm just going to give, I'm going to go over one example uh, in, in um, that's covered on on Johnson. We'll, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the Becky transfer. And then, then after that, we'll, we'll leave, we'll leave that topic to go into radiation. All right. I'm gonna look at open stacks, example 14.7. Now, before I write this example down, this example really discusses convection heat transfer from a home, from a house. Now, no matter how, how uh, heat resistant you think your house might be or how, or how insulated you think it might be. You might have good insulation, good windows. In a general house, if you don't like the air that's in your house right now, wait an hour. Because the air that'll be in your house an hour from now is entirely different air that was in your house presently. And what happens is air escapes through your walls, escapes through crevices in your windows, it escapes through the keyhole in your in your doorknob it escapes through the um you know the uh outlets and your, your electrical outlets it's constantly escaping in many complicated ways that involve turbulent mixing that involve convection heat transfer we have no idea how to calculate something like that all we can do is look at a gross phenomenon and say okay well when you're heating your house let's say in the winter time well what you're heating is you're constantly trying to heat give heat to new air that enters your house about every half an hour to an hour. And the other air has escaped. That's the best you can do. So here's an example of all you can really do in heat transfer, all right, and convection heat transfer. So I'm gonna rewrite this. Um, there's gonna be a lot of words as examples. I don't know if I can end up writing them all out, but OpenStax example 14.7. It says, bear with me, most houses are not airtight. So, <clears throat> so uh, air, air goes in and out of Around, uh, in and out around doors. All right. Um, and windows through cracks and crevices. Following wiring to switches and outlets and so. All 
right? <clears throat> the air in a typical house is completely replaced in less than an hour. As I just said. Right. <clears throat> um, suppose that a moderately sized house, which would be less than an All right, here's the problem. Suppose um, that a moderately sized house. has inside dimension uh, 12.0 meters by 18.0 meters by 3.00 meters high. And that all errors are placed in 30.0 minutes. Okay. Um, all right. Calculate the heat transfer heat per unit time space I have here. The heat transfer per unit time in watts. Um, needed to warm the incoming colder by 10 degrees Celsius. I have all the words here. It's a lot of words. All right, so Rita, most houses are not airtight. Air goes in and out of, around doors and windows through cracks and crevices following wiring and outlets and switches and so on. The air in a typical house is completely replaced in less than an hour. Suppose that a moderately sized house has inside dimensions of 12 meters by 18 meters by three meters high. And all air is replaced in 30 minutes. Calculate the heat transfer per unit time in watts. Needed to warm the incoming cold air by, by 10 degrees, all right? So we're not talking about what, what material the air is made out of. We're not talking about um, anything anything dealing you know, with, with thicknesses of walls or anything. We're just talking about the motion of air that's filling your house and, and it moves, the air moves, the heat moves with it, leaves your house, and you have, to, you have, you have all new air that is replaced. And we don't know how the air moves. It's too complicated. I mean, all we can really do is do a, a macroscopic gross calculation like, like, like the one here. All right, so that's all we're gonna do. So I'm gonna erase this. And that's as complicated as we can get in this level of class and really honestly in um, university physics too, or even more advanced physics plus. <clears throat> so, we go back to our equation, you know, heat is used to raise temperature of air. So heat is used 
to raise the temperature of air. by delta T. Our delta T is gonna be 10 degrees Celsius. We want the incoming air is gonna get raised by a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius. What equation governs that? Well, we go back to chapter 12. The heat would be given by MC delta T. Okay, remember you know what delta T is, delta T is, and we want, we want the heat transfer rate. So we're gonna wanna, we're gonna wanna count this heat and then utilize the fact we want to do it within 30 minutes. Now, we'll divide that, we'll divide our answer by 30 minutes. All right, so we know what the delta T is. So what we have to figure out is what is, you know, what, what, first of all, what is the mass of the air? And then I can look up the heat transfer coefficient of air. In fact, I can look up the heat transfer coefficient right now for air. So for air, C is simply going to be 1,000 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. That's for air. All right, so I have the C, I have the delta T, what I don't have is the M. So I have to figure out the mass of the air. Well, again, you know, you can't just put the air in a mass meter, it's a fluid. Remember back in fluid mechanics, we have to use the concept of density and volume. So we compute the mass of the air by the density of air times the volume of air in the house. All right, well, we know that the density of air, another constant to look up, is about 1.29 kilograms per meter cubed. That's air, density of air. And so we simply say, well, M is gonna be the density of air, 1.29 kilograms per meter cubed, then multiply by the volume of the house. And we got the dimensions of the volume of the house. We're told that they are, uh, 12 meters by 18 meters by three meters. So 12 meters by 18 meters by three meters. I do this calculation, I figure out the mass of the air in the house. And then I figured out it's going to be kind of a surprising number, 836 kilograms. That's a lot. That's how much air is sitting in your house. Now, I know M, I know C, I know delta T. This, we are able to now calculate the, um, the heat transfer mass, 836 kilograms. The specific heat of air, 1,000 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Okay, and um, we have the uh, temperature change. We're, we want to raise temperature of the air by 10 degrees Celsius. We find out the heat needed for, to, for that to occur will be 4.64 times 10 to the three watts. I'm sorry, joules. Actually, incorrect. It'll be 8.36 times 10 to the sixth joule. All right, look a little too far down on my notes. All right, so the heat necessary to raise the temperature of the air, that the replacement air in your house by an amount of 10 degrees is going to require 8.36 times 10 to the third joules worth of heat. We want to perform this heat transfer every 30 minutes because we predict that the, in this particular house that he will be entirely placed in each, each of every 30 minutes. So we have to do this heat transfer in 30 minutes. That'll give us the answer to the problem. All right, so we want Q over T or we want this 8.36 times 10 to the six joules every 30 minutes. Well, again, we want SI is we want the base units for times run in seconds, right? And so we know that there are 
than a minute and 60 seconds. We cancel out minutes accordingly. We find out that the rate of heat transfer that's needed is going to be 4.64 times 10 to the third watts or 4.64 kilowatts. That's the answer to the question. And that's all you can really do for convection heat transfer, certainly at this level and pretty much at most, at most levels. Now, convection is a very important mode of heat transfer. For one reason, it actually, it, uh, it is faster than conduction. So generally speaking, generally, The rate of convection heat transfer is faster than conduction. Now this helps us in some cases as humans and it hurts us in other cases. So for instance, on a hot summer day, You may wonder, well, my body is supposed to be maintained at a core temperature of 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. How is it that I can go say, walk outside of Fort Worth on a July day when it might be say 105 degrees Fahrenheit? How is it that I can even stand that? How is it that I, you know, that I, that I can even maintain my core temperature? And how you do that is through sweating. When you sweat, heat will leave your body through evaporation. Now, if you didn't have any kind of air movement, the evaporation would, 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 would essentially halt. The air movement allows convection to move the heat away from your body so that you can continue evaporating. So remember, remember the, um, remember the uh, example I gave back in, in uh, chapter 12 about, about you know, you take a, a pot of water, with a lid on it. So you have a pot of water. And on it is a lid, right? So what's happening, let me make this a little bit bigger. You have a pot of water with a lid. Right? There's your lid. Now, what's happening here is that you have a water level, and when when you when the boiling point is reached for the water, you have just as many molecules getting energy, getting kinetic energies that are fast enough to escape as water molecules that are that are already in the gaseous phase that are that are sticking to to the to the water to the liquid water. And so the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are the same. You have what's called equilibrium. And the vapor pressure, the pressure of the, of the vapor that is in that lid is the vapor pressure that is necessary for, for um, um, is, the, is the pressure is necessary for this equilibrium to, get, to, to, uh, to be maintained. So when you have the situation at, the boiling point, which is different for you know, depending upon the depending upon you know the the temperature and also the pressure uh, of the of the environment. You increase the pressure, you increase the boiling point. You reduce the pressure, like you go, you you, um, you climb a, a high mountain, you reduce the boiling point. But at at the boiling point, 
the rate of evaporation equals the rate of condensation. So the water will not leave, will not leave the, uh, will not, will, will not leave the pot. You know, it can't, it's, it's enclosed anyway, but you're not gonna get boiling. Now, when you take the lid off the pot, Let's take off the lid. Now what happens? When we take the lid off the pot, air carries away. the water vapor or some of the water vapor and the rate of evaporation from uh, for for the water in the pot is greater than a rate of condensation. This movement of this movement of, uh, of air that will, will allow the rate of evaporation to be greater, it can be, this is essentially a convective process. So when you think about your body, it's like that pot. Your body wants to, to release heat, all right? So what happens here is that it does so via, via evaporation, all right? And so, your body, on a hot day, on a day when the ambient temperature is greater than your core body temperature, Your body sweats. Thus, losing heat through the evaporation of water. You know, we are about 70% water. Okay, Mo moving air like wind outside of the body um, allows convection heat transfer to occur away from your body or to, to, to uh, blow heat away from your body to allow evaporation to continue. That's why you have the situations where 
some uh, dumb parent leaves their child in a hot car during the hot during the, during, during the summer. Well, what happens is, you know, the child does not survive because you can't have this convection heat transfer process. So the, the child eventually cannot maintain uh, his or her core body temperature and the outside heat, um, you know, that's in the car essentially overcomes that. So if you cannot, you have to maintain your core body temperature. That's why we sweat. We did not sweat, we would not survive. We would not be able to leave the house on a, hot, on a day when the, when the temperature outside was greater than the core body temperature. So heat transfer, convection transfer is your friend and convection transfer is faster than conduction heat transfer. So not only does this process, a convection process uh, allow, allow uh, evaporation to continue, it's done at a faster rate than conduction. So it, it allows the body to essentially get the heat transfer away from your body as quickly as possible, get the heat away from your body as quickly or, or in a quicker rate than let's say conduction, okay? Now, so heat transfer is your, con convection transfer is your friend during the summer, but it is your enemy during the winter when there's a, when there's a wind. So the same situation, if, let's say for instance, it's not a very, very hot day, but instead it's a very cold day and you have a wind. Well, on a very cold day, Well, on a cold day, you want to do the opposite. You don't want to get heat away from you. You want have you want to you want to bring in, maintain. You want to sustain the heat around your body. All right. So on a cold day, um, moving air also moves heat away from your body. convection. So your body loses heat by conduction and by and also we'll talk about by radiation as well, but and by the faster process of convection. This um, causes what we call wind chill. And this can be very dangerous during the winter. And, and it's a reminder that convection is a faster process than conduction. So let's give you an example of a table of wind chill factors I'm going to bring up here in a moment to tell you how, how significant this process actually is. So give me one second here. Going into the table on wind chills. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up, share my screen here, bring up the table on wind chills. So OpenStax gives a, gives a nice uh, table on what are called wind chill factors. Now wind chill factors, if you read the left-hand side of, the, uh, of the, um, the diagram, the left column, you see what the temperature actually is. So in the top column, it says the temperature is actually five degrees Celsius, which is very cold. Um, you know, typical household temperature might be, say, 20 to 25 Celsius, right? And your body temperature is around 37. So five is cold. So the left-hand column is, say, the first row we read across and say, okay, well, it's actually uh, five degrees Celsius, but that's moving air. Now, the wind, on the other hand, is um, um, across the top row, you have wind speeds of possible, and again, this is in bold, possible two meters per second, five meters per second, 10 meters per second, 15 and 20 meters per second. What the box is, you know, if you look at the intersection of the 
actual temperature and the wind speed, you get what the actual air feels like, i.e. what it really is for your body because all this heat's being moved away. So at five degrees Celsius, the real air, I'm just reading across the first column, even if the wind is only going at two meters a second, it really, it really feels like three degrees Celsius for you. If it's going at five meters a second, it feels like negative one. If it goes, if the wind is at, if it's at 20 meters per second, the, the temperature, the equivalent temperature for the heat transfer problem of your body is as if the outside temperature is negative 12. Is it as, it is as if the outside temperature is negative 12? So that's, that would be a wind chill you know, that you would actually feel. And this is real stuff. This is, this is where we have situations where we have frostbite. Now that's the five degree Celsius. If you talk about freezing, for instance, look at the column where, let's say the temperature is really zero degrees Celsius. Well, now you go across and let's say at 10 meters per second, it's, it's as if the temperature is negative 15. You go across the right, across the, the zero degree Celsius column again, if you go all the way to 20 meters per second, it is as if the temperature is negative 20 degrees Celsius. And again, this is degrees Celsius. Negative 20 is a, is a is much colder in degrees Celsius than say negative 20 Fahrenheit. All right. So so again, you're talking about negative 20 degrees Celsius. So that is so this is something that's a reminder that Quebec heat transfer works much faster than than uh, conduction heat transfer. And that the wind chill factor, what helps you during the summertime, works against you pretty rapidly in a winter time. This is why when um, when it's cold outside and it's also windy, if the if the um, people in the, in the Weather Channel are telling you that there are uh, alerts for wind chill, you need to take that very seriously. Okay, um, so this is uh, something that you need to make sure that you're not exposed to the air very long, and if you are exposed, you're covered up significantly. All right. All right. So let me do. Uh, let me see here. Let me do a couple of problems. Okay, I'm gonna do two problems out of OpenStax and we'll move on to radiation. So first problem OpenStax is uh, pretty short and gives you practice using that table. I'll kind of let you, you've all downloaded OpenStax, so I'll kind of let you, let you kind of do this problem for yourselves. But the way it reads is OpenStax 14.45. Uh, At what speed? Does negative 10 degrees Celsius air cause the same wind chill factor Um, as still air at negative 29 degrees Celsius. So if you read that table, you look at that table and you see where, well, this is kind of, let's kind of just do the problem. So let's go back to that table real quick. So again, at what speed, at what speed, does negative 10 degrees Celsius air, the actual temperature, uh, cause the same wind chill factor as still air at negative 29 degrees Celsius? All right, so let's quickly go back to that table and do this problem. Again, this problem is nothing more than just looking up at the table. So, so we're being told that the actual temperature of the air is uh, negative 10, but it feels like, or it, it, in all reality, it, it is as if it is air that is at that that is at is the same as still air at negative 29. So again, the same effect is that the still air 
was negative 29. But the, but the actual still error is negative 10. So we look at the table, and we look at the left column for negative 10 degrees Celsius for still error, read across, uh, there's negative 29. Negative, so this, so the, the error feels like still error at, neg at negative 29 degrees Celsius if the wind speed is only 10 meters per second. Okay, so if it's negative 10 degrees Celsius error moving at negative 10, uh, sorry, it's negative 10 degrees Celsius error moving at 10 meters per second, it is asked if the error is still error at negative 29 degrees Celsius. Negative, negative 29 degrees Celsius is dangerously cold air. Okay. You don't want to be out in that very long. That's all to that problem. So the answer to this problem is the answer to this problem is uh is uh 10 meters per second. All right. So again, read, after reading that table, I can indicate that I read that table. And the answer is looking at the table according to uh table you would say that the that this that speed would be 10 meters per second i mean that's really all there is to that problem reading that table this is uh i guess i would officially say according to open Science table 14.4 the above occurs or air moving at 10 meters per second. There's, that's all you'd have to do, no real calculation necessary. It's a table lookup. All right, I'm gonna do uh, OpenStax 14.47 now. Okay, um, this says the quote unquote steam above a freshly made cup of instant coffee is really water vapor droplets. Condensing after evaporating from the hot coffee. Evaporating. From the hot cup. Okay, um, what is the final temperature of, of uh, two, um, 2.5 sort of grams of hot coffee? Actually, 250 grams, I apologize. <laughs> what is the final temperature? I can't read my own handwriting. Of 250 grams of hot coffee initially at 90.0 degrees Celsius. If 2.00 grams evaporates from it. OK, 
Okay. Uh, the coffee is in a styrofoam cup. So no other no other methods of heat transfer can be so um other me uh, sorry other methods of heat transfer can be neglected. Every space left. Okay, uh, the steam, quote unquote, above a freshly made cup of instant coffee is really water vapor droplets condensing after evaporating from the hot coffee. What is the final temperature of 250 grams of hot coffee initially at 90.0 degrees Celsius if 2.00 grams evaporates from it? The coffee is in a styrofoam cup. So other methods of heat transfer can be neglected. Okay, so it's a, a nice little uh, heat transfer problem. Then we'll go to radiation. All right, here we go. So um, the heat loss from the coffee by the evaporation, so let's talk about, so we really have a mass of hot coffee that's 250 grams and two grams are gonna evaporate leaving 248 grams left of liquid hot coffee. So the fact that this evaporation is going to occur is going to, is going to be uh, associated with a heat loss due to the evaporation. How do you calculate that? Well, again, as we've talked about in chapter 12, the heat loss due to evaporation of, um, again, it's gonna be two grams but we really want to put this in kilograms, so divide by a thousand, 0 0.002 kilograms of coffee is given by, so remember, we're going to assume the uh, properties of water in the case of coffee usually. So Q is ML sub V. So again, this is a heat of vaporization. A mass little m of coffee. We can calculate that right now. So in a little bit of coffee that's evaporated is 0 0.002 kilograms. Remember, the heat of vaporization is huge. It's a very large number. Vaporization is, I mean, phase changes are very expensive heat ones. Heat of vaporization is 2256 times 10 to the third. Kilo, uh, joules per kilogram, and that's for water. And this is for for water. And there's a heat of vaporization for all the different substances. We do that calculation. The heat that has that has to be gained by the uh, in this uh, heat, in, heat in this process is going to be. 4512 joules. And of course, that's going to be at the expense of the coffee. Okay, so this heat is at the expense of the coffee. So heat gained through this small amount of coffee that got promoted to uh, gaseous phase was at the loss of heat for the remaining 248 grams of coffee. I'll say capital M, 248 grams or 0 
0.48 gram, kilograms of remaining liquid coffee. How do I figure that out? Well, that'll simply be that that same heat has to exhibit as a heat loss now. So a negative for the loss, okay? M C delta T, right? So it's, it's gonna be a loss, okay? Now, big M is gonna be 0 0.248 kilograms. C is the specific heat of liquid water. We're going to say. So again, as we've seen many times, it's uh, 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius for liquid water. I'm going to solve for delta T. So let's put this uh, heat value in a parking lot. And again, I have my real estate challenge here. So I'm going to save the heat I calculated from this from the steam process evaporation process. So we'll put that in the parking lot. The Q is 45, 12 joules. Now I want to solve for delta T. So I got to do is divide both sides by negative MC. Delta T is negative Q, this Q, over MC, big MC. Okay, so I find the delta T in that process. So the Q is to be negative 45, 12 joules. And the coffee that remains is 0 0.248 kilograms. And the specific heat of liquid water, which we have to look up in the you know, table, appropriate table, that'd be 4186 joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. I find that delta T when I do this will be negative 4.35 degrees Celsius. So the water, as we would expect, goes down in temperature because of the heat loss. So I'm being asked what the final temperature of the, of the, of the coffee is. All right, and so, so we want the final temperature of coffee. So the coffee, the, the delta T is given as T final minus T initial, right? We know the T initial of the coffee. We're given that as 90 degrees Celsius. That was the value we're given. You know, so what I got to do is, is solve for the for T final. So I'm going to add T initial to both sides. T final is going to be simply T initial. It's positive now. I put, I put it on the left side. And then flip it about equal sign again. Plus delta T. All right, T initial. It's 90 degrees Celsius and then plus what? A negative value, right? So it's really a minus. Negative 4.35 degrees Celsius. T final, if I do this subtraction, is 85.7 degrees Celsius. That is how hot the coffee will be after it loses this two grams of steam. Okay. All right, well, that sums up convection. Now we go to the third of three modes, that's radiation, all right? That's the third way heat transfer can occur. Very important to us because we got all of our energy from the sun. And so radiation from the sun is the process that's life-sustaining for us. So very important process, radiation. The third mode of heat transfer. All right, so now, as we've progressed through physics one, we start to, I would say, flirt with the concepts of physics two. So when you, in physics two, we end up talking about the need for quantum theory. And there are a number of different, you know, we, we physicists were very confident at the end of the uh, 1900s. In fact, uh, Lord Kelvin, who is, I would say, the, you can call him the elder statesman physicist for the, uh, for the uh, 19th century. I mean, it really would have been James Clerk Maxwell 
had he lived long enough. You know, he died, I think, in 1870, unfortunately, after his great achievement of, uh, of amalgamating electromagnetic theory in 1865. So it was Lord Kelvin, who was the elder statesman physicist, he gave what was called the famous two clouds speech, which he kind of said, which he said, well, I feel sorry for all future physicists in the world, those trying to get their PhDs, because, well, we pretty much solved it all. Uh, you know, we have a very successful theory of mechanics. We have a very successful uh, theory of thermodynamics or thermal physics. And we also, and we have, we'll talk about this in physics too, we also have an extremely successful theory, electromagnetic theory. All we have to do is work out a couple of clouds on the horizon, as he called it. Well, those clouds were relativity and quantum theory, and they were revolutions. Uh, so he couldn't have been more wrong. I don't blame him, though. I mean, you know, he was a person in the sign of the times. And this kind of shows the great confidence that physicists had toward the end of the end of the 1900s, or sorry, the end of the 1800s, <clears throat> you know, ent you know, entering the 20th century. But there were some uh, phenomena that could not be explained through the physics that we've learned in this class or through electromagnetic theory. And one of the such phenomena is radiation heat transfer. Nobody can understand it. Uh, so radiation heat transfer really requires quantum physics, all right? And so the, the idea is, you know, um, so on the ink on this pen. All right, so to understand radiation heat transfer, Um, re requires quantum physics or quantum theory. We we uh, discuss quantum theory in physics too. So I'm not really going to attempt to discuss it here at all, you know. But but we need to understand what are called photons. That light is not only an electromagnetic wave; it's also composed of particles that we that are energy packets, which we call photons. We need this information to be able to understand. Uh, radiation heat transfer. So at this point, you know, in the in the class, there is, you know, at least if you look at the chron chronology of physics, people did not understand why the, why this is the case. Um, now it turns out that you know there's phenomena, for instance, that you know, if, if, let's say you if you heat an object like a metal. It glows at different colors. You know, you might see it starting at red. Keep heating, it'll go to orange. Eventually it goes kind of to like a blue. Eventually it ends up going to like a white. You talk about things being white hot. So there is a phenomena that the that the light given off during these processes changes colors. Effectively, um, the uh, higher the temperature, so effectively the the um, um, so the heat is transferred, you know, by radiation heat transfer. So essentially, the 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 higher the temperature the smaller the wavelength or the higher the frequency. The higher the temperature, this requires kind of looking at a, at a uh, diagram of um, colors, a color chart for visible light, but we'll, we'll walk through this and I'll kind of, we'll talk about this in a moment here. So the higher the temperature, the smaller the wavelength, of emitted light, we'll say emitted, let's be more general, electromagnetic radiation,
and the greater and the higher the frequency. So imagining that I'm heating something, it goes red hot, orange hot, blue hot, and eventually like white hot, right? Well, so let's kind of remind ourselves, and again, this is a, another physics two topic that I'm kind of borrowing, and I'm hoping that you know some of you have come into the class with some of this knowledge of the rainbow, for instance. So if you look at a rainbow, And we'll officially talk about rainbows in uh, physics too. We talk about optics, okay? But let's just kind of talk about a, a general knowledge of rainbows before you walk into this class. You see, a, 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 you know, rainbows and they're broken up. The colors are, or, or maybe the white light going into a prism. Colors are broken up, and we remember Roy G. Bibb, our friend Roy G. Bibb. Roy G. Bibb. That stands for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You know, sometimes we don't we don't think about indigo, but so essentially the longer, longest wavelength, longest wavelength, you use wavelength, and it's just like in waves, lambda. And this is the shortest wavelength, blue or violet. Okay. Well, as we look, as we look, we as we continue raising the temperature, we go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, right? We go from the we go to shorter wavelengths, as we can see, red getting you know orange hot, blue, so on and so forth. You know, essentially the the wavelength of which the which the light which the electromagnetic waves are given off actually reduce in wavelength. Well, if they reduce in wavelength, they increase in frequency. So in, we, we understand that um, all, we talk about wave theory, but all waves follow the standard formula of B equals lambda F, or F lambda, what's it lambda F? All right, so again, all waves, this is the propagation speed of a wave. Lambda is the wavelength, F is the frequency in Hertz. Well, in electromagnetic theory, the waves have to travel at the speed of light, C. So these two wavelength times frequency have to multiply together to give you C. So if the wavelength gets smaller, well, the product has to be the same, right? That means the frequency has got to get bigger. That means that the frequency is smallest in visible light for red and it's greatest for violet. And it's even greater for, let's say, ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is basically means beyond violet. Ultraviolet going to X-rays and finally gamma rays. If you go to longer waves like infrared, you get longer wavelengths, shorter frequencies, and so on and so forth, all about the radio, radio waves, right? So again, there's electromagnetic spectrum. Now, we understand that there is this relationship between, let's say, the frequency and, and, the, and the energy. So more energetic rate, wave, uh, rate waves have higher frequency. So higher frequency waves. So again, um, radiation, heat, radiation is carried by electromagnetic waves. Okay, the greater, the higher the frequency, of electromagnetic waves, the greater the energy.
Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. So a good example of radius heat transfer that we receive on the Earth is from the sun. You know, so we receive radius heat transfer from the sun. So it's an example of it. Well, the sun is a great example. So we re so the Earth receives almost all of its energy from the sun. Carried by electromagnetic waves. Through space. In the generally the ultraviolet. Visible and infrared. Regions of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, as it's called. And are kind of sort of delving into physics too, without meaning to. So again, electromagnetic spectrum is all uh, all regions of you know essentially uh, all types of waves you can imagine are you know all these different kinds of waves like radio waves and visible light, infrared, ultraviolet, X rays, gamma rays. They're all electromagnetic waves. They just have a different wavelength or frequency. They all travel the speed of light. So again, you know, unlike Unlike uh, conduction and convection, which require a medium, electromagnetic waves do not require a medium. In fact, in fact, they are best in a vacuum. Medium uh, media do things like uh, slow them down or cause attenuation, and so you know they end up interacting with the media. However, in in a, in a vacuum, they're you know they they are pretty much unfettered. All right, and so now. What we have to understand, and again, I'm going to kind of give a very, very brief, um, brief uh, description of what is, what's called black body radiation. I'll talk more about it in uh, physics too. We have to understand a little bit of quantum theory. I mean, or at least we need to touch upon, you know, the need for quantum theory. We're not going to talk quantum theory here, at least not this semester. All right, we will, we will in the spring. Or not on spring, sorry, that we will in physics too. All right, so so physicists basically found out that you know if you look at um, radiated energy depends on intensity. So, or actually, it's all. There's a, well, let me give you a, let me give you a uh, intensity versus wavelength diagram. For radiation. All right, so when, when, when scientists uh, heated up objects and looked at the, radiated, the radiation heat transfer from those objects, all right? So again, these objects are heated and we look at the uh, radiated intensity. Intensity is basically the, the power divided by the area. So remember the intensity, talk about this in waves, is power over an area and power is an energy divided by time really officially to work for time but we'll just kind of you know so essentially we have energy enwrapped in here so so the intensity is going to be the power or to radiate or the uh energy rate 
per unit area. Okay, so you're looking at, a, 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 you know, various intensities. That way you divide by the area, you don't have to worry about a larger a, a object in the experiment versus a smaller one. You just look at the, the energy rate per area. We come to find out that if we consider objects that are lower temperatures, so we're gonna kind of look at, we're, we're looking at the uh, wavelength versus the intensity, okay? <clears throat> we'll consider, let's say an object that's heated at 3000 kelvins. We're gonna kind of look at lambda being in nanometers, and that's a billionth of a meter. And we'll imagine, let's say, I'm just gonna to try to draw this as quickly as I can. This is zero. This is say a thousand nanometers. This is say 2000, say 3000. And we imagine an object, you know, um, essentially being heated at 3000 Kelvin. And uh, we're gonna consider an object that's a perfect emitter. So we're gonna consider, we'll, and we'll say that those are called black body. Perfect emitters are called black bodies, and I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, consider what are called black bodies, which are objects that are perfect emitters, all right? So I'll explain why they're called black bodies in a moment. Let's imagine we have a black body. Now, if I have the temperature at say 300 Kelvin, I'll notice an intensity curve, you know, then, you know if I you know, heat it up, I'll notice that that intensity curve would look something like this. Let's see, it maxes out around. Well, nothing much to talk about there. This is at, a, this is at about, 3000 Kelvin, or sorry, 300 Kelvin. So I heat the object to 300 Kelvin. Now this intensity is in, um, this is a radiant intensity. Okay, I'm not gonna give the units on it. We're gonna give the idea. Now I'm gonna consider an object that's gonna be heated at 4,000, at four, sorry, this is 3000 Kelvin, so I apologize. 3000 Kelvin. Now imagine an object goes to, at 4,000 Kelvin, I'm gonna realize it's gonna peak right around 1,000. It's gonna, it's gonna come up, it's gonna peak, and it's gonna come back down. Okay, this is a, the profile at 4,000 Kelvin. And at 5,000 Kelvin, I'll notice the peak being greater and in a, in a, in a, in a much, you know, in much lower, uh, smaller uh, wavelength. Again, as it heats an object, the wavelength goes down of the emitted light. So notice that in my experiment, as I increase a temperature, what I have is intensity curves that are going to peak out at a greater intensity and progressively at a smaller, smaller wavelength. So if I so if I take if I imagine having 4,000 kelvins, the intensity curve of, of what we call the black body is going to actually have a peak that's greater in intensity and at a wavelength that is smaller. And if I go to 5,000 kelvins, the intensity will be greater and the wavelength even smaller. In this re particular region, I'll I'll look and it's about, uh, this region here is, is around the, is the infrared we call IR and further in here might be the visible, all right? So anyway, you know, so, so in some cases, you know, a lot of this is gonna be, you know, in some cases you'll actually have, you'll actually have the, you um, know, a lot of cases you'll have the, you have the, uh, uh, Longer wavelengths, you know, will be a larger IR. But again, we go into a little bit in the visible, but 
oftentimes in the IR. Okay, so we talk about, um, so this is the region in which, you know, you, you'll start seeing objects getting, as objects get hotter, they have a smaller solar wavelength. Again, this is wavelength versus intensity. And so we're seeing the, we're seeing that as objects heat up, they get, they get, um, they get hotter, the wavelength in which, in which the, 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 in which the maximum intensity occurs is smaller and smaller. So in that case, it's just like I said earlier, you know, things will go red hot, and then they'll, they'll go into like, you know, they'll, they'll long, at longer wavelengths of red, and they'll get shorter wavelengths like blue, all right? And so, so we see this, and we, and kind of physicists have no idea before quantum theory, why it's true. In quantum theory, we are able to actually understand this exactly. So essentially the intensity, what did I just show you? The intensity or rate of radiation emission Uh, increases dramatically with temperature. And, um, and the spectrum shifts to uh, toward the visible and ultraviolet parts of the spectrum. Um, so the, uh, this, the spectrum shifts toward the, um, the visible and ultraviolet parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that is the phenomenon. We need quantum theory to understand it. All right. So this requires understanding this requires quantum theory. And you'll hear about Max Planck, for instance. Max Planck is where he comes in. Some people refer to him as the father of quantum mechanics. He is a Nobel laureate, German, excellent German physicist, uh, who uh, is the first person to talk, understand um, what we call black body radiation. All right. Now, what are we seeing? What is the principle involved here? Okay, so all objects absorb and emit electromagnetic radiation, number one, including your body. Your body emits and it also absorbs electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the rate of heat transfer by radiation. All right, so <clears throat> rate of heat transfer uh, by, ra uh, by radiation is largely determined by the color of the object.
And I've given some examples of, of you know, the, the color variation in the experiment I just discussed, but <clears throat> black is most effective. Okay, and white is least effective. All right, and so the so people living in hot climates will typically avoid wearing white clothing or black or black clothing. They were they typically will wear white clothing. So the so people. in hot climates typically avoid wearing black clothing. Not like desert climates. Another situation is asphalt. You imagine like, you know, you, you look at, uh, and again, a lot of it has to deal with, you know, um, you know, the nature of the, of the material in this case, you know, the color of the material for radiation transfer. But depending upon the color of the material, you know, that uh, you'll have, you know, greater, greater radiation, it'll be significant. So let's, let's say in a very hot day, you have black asphalt. There's another example. So black asphalt in a parking lot, Um, has a will be hotter than the adjacent gray sidewalk. So, you know, so you can actually get a burn, sunburn by, or, or not sunburn, but you can get burned uh, by touching black asphalt. I mean, it could be you know, much hotter than say gray sidewalk. And so again, this is, this is all because of the color of the asphalt. Black is a much greater emitter and, um, emitter and absorber than say gray or white, all right? And so we have a general formula that describes radiation heat transfer. And this formula, once you understand quantum theory, you can actually derive this formula. And you can actually derive this formula for first principles. All right, so the formula for heat transfer, so the heat transfer rate formula for radiation heat transfer, can be derived from first principles. Using quantum theory. So unlike conduction heat transfer, all we all we're left with, you know, all we can use is a is an empirical formula convection heat transfer we can't really do much of anything because we haven't solved turbulence and radiation heat transfer we can actually use a formula that actually can be derived directly and 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 precisely from quantum theory and so we do this we get the following formula q over t and all these heat transfer equations must be rates is going to be sigma e a times t to the fourth. That is the formula. So I'm, I'm going to write. I'm going to write this back up here, and we'll talk about this. So hang on, let me, let me get the whiteboard to talk about this formula. So let me write it on the top. So again, this is a radiation transfer formula. It can be it can be derived 
directly from uh, quantum theory. So again, it is Q over T is sigma, little sigma, it's a Greek little s, E A, T to the fourth. So a T to the fourth looks a little bit bizarre, but that's what you get. It's really from a simple integral in calculus to get this, to get this answer. So it really becomes a, uh, something that you can derive directly from uh, quantum theory. Sigma is called the Stefan Bolt. This, this is actually called the Stefan Boltzmann law. That's the name of it, Stefan and Boltzmann. Uh, the Stefan Boltzmann constant. So sigma is a constant. Again, this is little s. So sigma is a little s in Greek. And we've seen this before, right? We've seen capital sigma and little sigma. Use capital sigma, you know, for um, doing summations. So again, this is a letter. This is a letter in the Greek alphabet, little s. Okay. So sigma is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. It is given by the value of 5.67 times 10 to the negative eight joules per funny units here. Second meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. And you can take a look at the formula and kind of derive these units. This is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Okay. What about the other things? Well, E is called, well, so let's, let's go to A. A, I'm going to E last. A is the actual surface area of the object. So the object is going to have a surface area. Basically through which heat transfer occurs. We'll say through which the radiation transfer occurs. Okay, the T is the absolute temperature in Kelvin. After being Kelvin, why? Because we have Kelvin in the sigma form or in the sigma uh, formulation. We've talked about Kelvin temperatures. And finally, E is a property of a, of a material called its emissivity. E is a number in the range from zero to one. Zero, the emissivity equals one's a perfect emitter. We refer, we refer to that as a black body. All right, the perfect emitter is also a perfect absorber. Uh, E equals zero is a perfect reflector. So emissivity is a unitless number between zero and one. And it's described, you know, basically it's, it's a value that you're either told or have to look up. So again, this is a, this is a quality, quality of, a, of, a, of a body. You know, when you're talking about when Planck, Max Planck did his work, he assumed the black body. So he didn't, so everything he did was emissivity equals one. You know, the, I would say the empirical nature that goes to this formula is that sometimes things are not perfect emitters or, you know, and so you, and so you have to apply an emissivity factor on it. All right. So, 
let's see here. Now, that's the general form of it. Now, you could have an object that radiates in an environment that are different at different temperatures. So let's talk about that for a moment. All right. And so we have the, all, all objects emit and absorb radiation, as I said. Okay. Now, um, The net heat transfer of the radiation uh, relates to the temperature of the object and then also the temperature of the environment. So uh, the net heat transfer okay, that's what we're really after. That's really the absorption minus the emission. All right, so that's a net heat transfer, the absorption. Minus the emission. Okay, so the net heat transfer is that's related to both the temperatures of the object the object under study. And the temperature of its surroundings. Okay, so you have to fix up the transfer formula to account for this. And it's pretty easy to do. If you imagine the net heat transfer, if you imagine that the, let's say, for instance, that. Uh, the object is a temperature T1. So let me kind of erase this for a moment. Let's say the object is a temperature T1, the surroundings have a temperature T2. So let's let the object have temperature T1. and the surroundings. T2. Well, the net heat transfer rate looks very much like the formula I just wrote down, Q net over T will simply be sigma EA but multiplied by T2 to the fourth minus T1 to the fourth. Again, T1 is the temperature of the actual object that's performing radiation heat transfer, and T2 is the temperature of the surroundings. That's the general formula for the net heat transfer rate through radiation, okay? Now, um, we have um, a number of different interesting phenomena that occur because of this. So, so again, you know, we receive all of our energy for the most part from, from the sun, all right? So let's kind of talk about how that happens, all right? Let's, let's talk about what situation we're in. Why, is our, why do we have a climate where we actually can live in it? And a lot of it's depending upon this equation and certain properties being just right. All right. So let's, again, we'll remind ourselves of this equation. We'll do a few problems, um, you know, for radiation. But let's kind of, let's kind of discuss, you know, as a scientist, um, you need to be aware, I, I, I guess, of the socioeconomic and political environment that you're in as well. Okay, so I'm gonna discuss something that might be a relatively hot button topic in a moment, 
But again, as a scientist, um, you know, we are have to remind ourselves that we need to be driven by data and not by our prejudices or what we may want the data to say. We have to be driven by, by what the data actually does say. All right. So let's kind of let's kind of go back a moment here. So let's kind of develop what I want to say. So so we know the Earth. So the Earth receives almost all of its energy from radiation from the sun. Okay, I've said that before. And that is through radiation heat transfer. Okay, so that's that's a given right there. Um, you know, because the sun is hotter than the earth, the heat transfer goes from the sun to the earth. All right. Now. The rate of radiation heat transfer from the sun to the earth is less than what the previous formula would predict. Since the sun does not fill the sky. All right, so it's, it's a part of the sky. So on average, so when all together, you know, essentially, you know, we have that part as well. Emissivity also varies. All right, so again, the, so, so the arranging transfer formula is not as if, the entire environment was at this particular uh, um, temperature. You know, the sun is a point in the in the sky. It's it's a smaller part of the sky that, that it occupies. Uh, the average emissivity of the Earth is about is rough, roughly about zero point six five. And it varies due to variable cloud cover. And clouds are highly reflective. So you don't even get 100% rate of heat transfer anyway, because the Earth has emissivity of about 0 0.65. All right, and so the idea is that um, that we end up having effectively a negative feedback loop, you know, that that we that we have, um, you know, that that goes into place. So what ends up happening is, you know, some of the radiation goes through the Earth or some of that radiation goes through the atmosphere. So some of the radiation from the sun
is transmitted through the atmosphere. And some, like around 40, 35% or so, is reflected directly back in, into space. Okay. Now we want to, so the particle goes back in space, you know, well, that just goes off who knows where, but we want, we want to focus on what actually has entered the Earth's atmosphere. All right. Now, out of the, of the radiation, that has entered the atmosphere. Some is absorbed by the earth. And some is reflected off of the earth. All right, so some of the radiation that is comes from the sun, you have one layer, the atmosphere, you have either the radiation, say 65% of it or so goes through um, the atmosphere, say 35% gets reflected directly back into space. And of the radiation that has entered the atmosphere, some of it gets absorbed by the earth, some of it gets reflected off of the earth. Okay, and so what happens here is that um now some of this radiation gets reflected back off of the clouds all right so some of the radiation reflected off of the ground We refer to this as re-radiation. Yes, it is a real word. Re-radiation um, is reflected by the clouds in the um, in the atmosphere. Or, you know, which we, we refer to that as the atmospheric H2O, the water vapor, or the CO2. Carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, other ones. Now, essentially, this traps the heat. So this process traps heat and is called the greenhouse effect. Anybody who's ever had a greenhouse knows how this works. You want to grow, grow tomatoes, for instance, you have, you make yourself a greenhouse. You know, light goes through the plastic or whatever covers your greenhouse, is radiated, some of it's absorbed by your plants and stuff, some of it gets re-radiated and gets trapped in your greenhouse because it doesn't escape. It, you know, it, it essentially gets reflected back into the greenhouse. It's called the greenhouse effect. This is the re-radiation. This is very real. 
the greenhouse effect, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for the greenhouse effect, the greenhouse effect is generally good. If it wasn't for the greenhouse effect, the average temperature of the Earth would be about 40 degrees Celsius lower than it is, all right? Life would not be able to exist. Okay, so if it wasn't for the greenhouse effect, The average temperature of the Earth would be about 40 degrees Celsius lower. And life as we know it, cannot exist. Well, so, you know, everything's good in moderation. Now, if, if you have too much greenhouse effect, then you have too much heat being tra transferred, and of course, too much, or too much heat being trapped, and of course, heat being trapped, we have this negative feedback loop, that's heat transfer that causes a temperature change. Heat causes a temperature change. We hear about global warming, or as we now call it, climate change, but it is very real. So, so this is the greenhouse effect, which is in general generally good. The atmosphere essentially not only protects us from, from uh, ultraviolet radiations and, and uh, for instance, cosmic, cosmic particles and rays you know, in, in, in the universe, it also, gives us essentially a very thin biosphere in which we live, all right? And so what happens here is that, you know, we have too much, too much carbon emissions. This is real, no matter what you're being told by other sources. Um, there are, there is an excessive amount of carbon emissions. causing too much heat absorption. And hence, an increasing temperature. So radiation heat transfer, which you're studying in this chapter, is the source of what we're what we typically refer to as global warming, or it's been politicized to be called climate change now. However you want to call it, it is this process. You can name it whatever you want. What happens if this goes out of control? Rising sea levels. Why? Because you have a melting, a melting glaciers, a melting, a melting poles. You have more intense storms, like hurricanes. And essentially, you have the life as we know it again being challenged. All right, and so. We have uh, we've had uh, protocols in place to protect against these uh, problems. Um, so we had a protocol uh, called the Paris Accord. I don't know why our country decided to pull out of that, but the Paris Accord, you may have heard in the news, is an agreement among countries. To re 
reduce emissions, carbon emissions. Hopefully we'll go back into the Paris Accord sooner than later. We pulled out in our country pulled out in, in 2017. Um, there's another one, you know, that another one called the Montreal Protocol. I'll talk about this in physics too. Which um which essentially reduces um, the production of what are called carbon fluorocarbons, fluorofluorocarbons. Fluoro, spelling is not good, fluoro. Fluoro carbons. Chlorofluorocarbons, yeah, CFCs for short. From refrigerants, which eat the ozone layer. So we try to, scientists try to warn people about these things. So again, Mont Paris Accord is the agreement to reduce carbon emissions, which helps control the greenhouse effect. That's warming the planet. Uh, Montreal Protocol, it reduces, the, we, we'll talk more about this in physics too. Chlorofluorocarbons, you know, from refrigerants that eat the ozone layer. So these are very important things. Now I, I'll, I'll work, I'll, I'll finish up this uh, lecture with a couple of problems, but I kind of want to leave you a thought from Carl Sagan. All right, and so he's somebody who was very worried about this problem. And he gave us something that I felt was uh, quite an amazing uh, uh, approach or to, to think about this. So I'm gonna show you a picture of a globe. I try to find one. I mean, he, ha he has one on the, his show called Cosmos. And I, and I, would, I would suggest that if you ever see a, a, a great show, um, something that's a great scientific show, uh, written by somebody who's a great communicator of science, it'd be Cosmos. So you see in this picture, a big globe. And, it's, and I try to put a human with this. You see this woman right here next to the globe. You see this very large globe. This globe is covered by a very thin layer of lacquer. So what Carl Sagan said, if you look at the earth, the lacquer that is on the surface of the earth is like the atmosphere that protects us. That is how thin the atmosphere is. It is a very, very thin atmosphere. The, our entire, um, our, our entire uh, um, uh, life, if you will, all our, our entire biosphere, if you will, is, in, is protected by this very, very thin layer of atmosphere. The atmosphere, I mean, literally from here to outer space is only 50 miles. So there's not much atmosphere covering the earth. And this is everything we have here. We're, we're talking about needing to um, be able to regulate, um, you know, our, our damaging of this. I mean, this is really how, this is how, I mean, if you look at, you know, if you look at from outer space, you know, we're surrounded by the blackest black of outer space. We're surrounded by the vacuum of space. Everything we've ever known is on this earth. All of our life is on this earth. It's all being protected by this very thin layer of atmosphere. Okay, so this really gets down to the, the nature of what we're talking about when we talk about global, uh, talk about climate change and global warming. Again, I don't mean to get political in this class, but at the same time, you as scientists need to know what the truth is, need to know what the facts are regarding what's actually going on, what are the calculations, and that we do understand this very well. I mean, we understand that we are, even the slightest traces of carbon, uh, addition carbon uh, causes a very large effect. All right, so that is the, uh, the concept of the climate change. So I'm going to um, do a few problems and we'll call it, we'll, we'll call this uh, lecture done. All right, so let's look at OpenStax 14.55. So at what rate does heat radiate?
from a 275 meter squared black roof. On a night when the roof's temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, And the surrounding temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, the emissivity of the roof is 0 0.900. So the emissivity. of the roof is E equals 0 0.900. All right, so again, at what rate does heat tra the heat radiate from a 275 meters square black roof, that's the area, on a night when the roof temperature is 30 degrees Celsius and the surrounding temperature is 15 degrees Celsius? The emissivity of the roof is, is equal to 0 0.900. Okay, so we need to use the radiation heat transfer equation for the net uh, radiation heat transfer. So let's, um, so I'm going to erase this and just remind ourselves what these uh, values will be when we do the English to mathematics translation. Okay, so um, the formula that we want to use, again, is going to be Q net divided by T. It's going to be sigma EA. Times T two to the fourth minus T one to the fourth. Okay. Now we have a laundry list of what we know. The area of the roof is 275 meters squared. Okay, the emissivity is 0 0.900. We have T2. Now, we have to put these temperatures in Kelvin. We have to do these calculations for, for radiation transfer. They must be done in Kelvin temperatures. All right, and so we're given 15.0, but remember to go to Kelvin, you had 273. All right, so that gives you 288 Kelvin. You gotta use Kelvin temperature. In the same case, T1, well, there we're given 30 Celsius, but again, we've gotta to go to Kelvin. So again, this transformation is very simple. You just add 273 and you get to two, you get to 303 Kelvin. A little bit of work to get to convert to the right temperatures. Now we're ready to go, two nets over T, sigma, Stefan Boltzmann constant, 5.67 times 10 to the negative eight. It's gonna be uh, funny units, it's gonna be joules per second meter squared, Kelvin to the fourth, those are the units. E, unit less, 0 0.900. A, area, 275 meters squared. Now, this is where people get messed up. They have to find these fourth power. Okay, so these temperatures are in fourth power. So T2, 288 Kelvin. So 288 Kelvin to the fourth minus T1, 303 Kelvin to the fourth. Okay, very important. Each of these fourth powers have to be, um, you have to take the fourth power of each one and then subtract them. 
288 to the fourth minus 303 to the fourth in those brackets over there. Okay, when you work all this stuff out, you find out that Q naught over T is going to equal negative 2.17. Times 10 to the fourth watts, or you can maybe put this in kilowatts, negative, negative 21.7 kilowatts. Now, why is it negative? Well, it's negative because heat, this is really a heat loss. It's a heat loss from the black roof. Okay, heat loss from the black roof, that's why it is negative. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna do uh, next problem is gonna be uh, open sex 14.57. Okay, uh, this says radiation makes it impossible to stand close to hot lava flow. Calculate the rate of heat transfer by radiation from one point zero zero meters squared. of 1200 degrees Celsius fresh lava from an in, into a 30.0 degree Celsius surroundings. Assuming lava's emissivity is 1.00. All right, radiation makes it impossible, staying close to hot lava flow. Calculate the rate of heat transfer by radiation from 1.00 meters squared to 1200 degrees Celsius fresh lava into 30.0 degrees Celsius surroundings, assuming lava's emissivity is 1.00. Okay, so fairly straightforward calculation. Remember what we just wrote here. Again, it's another application of what we just, uh, what we just said. So again, QNET over T is sigma E A, T two to the fourth minus T one to the fourth. Okay, uh, E is 1.00 as advertised, that's the emissivity. We're looking at a one meter squared of lava. A is gonna also be 1.00 meter squared. And T two, again, that is your surroundings, that's 30 Celsius plus 273 is 303 Kelvin. T1, we're told is 1200 degrees Celsius, very hot. But again, you had to add 273 to get it into Kelvin. So that's gonna be uh, 1473 Kelvin. Q net over T is 
5 sigma, 5.67 times 10 to the negative 8 joules per second meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. E, 1.00. A, 1.00 meters squared times, we have 303 Kelvin to the fourth. Minus 1473 Kelvins to the fourth. We find out that Q naught over T, we do this calculation, is negative 2.66 of 10 to the fifth watts. which is negative 266 watts, kilowatts, as you say. All right. One last one to do. Uh, in, this, in this video, that's problem 14.62 of open sex. All right. I'll as follows. The sun radiates like a perfect black body. In the of exactly one. That's what that means. Okay, um, A. Calculate the surface temperature of the sun. Given that it is a sphere, uh, with a seven zero zero times an eight meter radius, the radius that radiates three point eight zero times ten to the six, sorry, ten to twenty six watts. into three Kelvin space. B, how much power does the sun radiate per square meter on its surface? And finally, C, how much power in watts per square meter is that value of distance of Earth? All right, and then finally, um, no, I'm sorry, one five percent of 11 meters away. Okay, three parts of this problem. 
the sun radiates like a perfect black body with an emissivity of exactly one. A, calculate the structure of the sun given that it is a sphere with a 7.00 times 10 to the 8th meter radius that radiates 3.80 times 10 to the 20th blocks into three Kelvin space. A lot of information here. B, how much power does the sun radiate per square meter on its surface? And then C, how much power in square, in per square meter is that value at the distance of Earth, which is 25 to 10 to 11 meters away, which is the meter equivalent of 93 million miles. Okay, so a lot of information. It's a radiation heat transfer problem. There's nothing between the sun and the Earth but space. And not the conduction, you're not going to have convection. Only heat transfer will be via radiation at the speed of light. Okay. So let's figure out, first of all, um, we, we know that we're given what Q net divided by our per time is. We're given, we're given this up here. Q net over time, that's handed to us in the problem. That's a negative 3.80 times 10 to the 26 watts. Again, the negative sign indicates that power is being radiated away from the sun. The sun is a hot object and being radiated into, into very, very cold surrounding space that's a three kilo. Okay. Now, we know a few other things. We know what we would prefer to as temperature T2 is just three Kelvin. It's already given to us in Kelvin. It's very, very cold. It's just three Kelvin above absolute zero. We want to find T1. We're being asked, what is the temperature of the sun? Okay, that's what T1 is. That's the temperature of the sun. All right. And so um, what's our formula? Well, it's Q out over T is sigma EA that's a quantity, <clears throat> T2 to the fourth minus T1 to the fourth. I want to solve for T1 and, it's, and in this form, it appears to the fourth power. A little bit about that's done. So the first thing I want to do is I'll, I'll basically write what's on the right side and the left and vice versa. So I'll write number one, that's sigma EA times T2 to the fourth minus T1 to the fourth is Q net over T. Now, Q T is the, is the um, power, radiated power from the sun. That was given to me. That's what that is. All right, so the first thing I want to do algebraically is what I want to, I want to divide everything through by sigma EA. So I'm trying to get to T1 to the fourth. So let's kind of start stripping things out. So what I can write here is T2 to the fourth minus T1 to the fourth is one over sigma EA. All of this I know. And then again, A depends on where you're looking. A is going to have one value when I'm asking for the surface area of the, of the sun. At its surface, A will have another value when I'm asking, you know, if I'm trying to figure out what Q over T is at the Earth. All right, so, so again, I'm not going to write anything for A yet. We'll, we'll get to that when we get that right. You know, so anyhow, um, Q net over T. Let's go ahead. So a little algebraic manipulation. I can essentially solve for T1 by essentially doing what? I can subtract T2 fourth from each side, multiply through by negative one, and I'll still have a fourth power. So what do I do? I take the one fourth power of each side. I do all of that algebra. I find out the following. That I have T1, and it's not that much algebra. It's just a couple of steps. But T1 is equal to, I'll say, brackets. Okay, so it's going to be T2 to the fourth, okay, minus Q net over T times quantity one over sigma E A. All of that is to one fourth power, right? So I manipulated and I still have T1 to the fourth power. To get T1, I have to take the fourth power of each side. Okay, that is the final equation before I plug in numbers. This gives me the surface, this gives me the temperature of the sun. When I do this, all right. So I'm going to erase everything. I'm going to so I'm going to put the equation on the very top now. I need to conserve real estate. All right. So um, let's write that one as. So again, what did I say? T1 is brackets. I have two T to the fourth minus Q net over T plus one over sigma E A. All of this is the one fourth power. Yeah, I'll plug in downwards. T1. Okay, so my T2 is the three Kelvin outer space. So three Kelvins all to the fourth minus, okay, let's be careful. Q net over T is a, is a, is a negative number. It's minus negative number. So remember, uh, heat has a sign convention to it. Negative means that the heat is leaving the system. In this case, the system is the sun. So it's leaving, it's going into outer space toward the earth. So negative of negative 3.80 times 10 to the 26 watts. All right, and then I have one over sigma EA. That's a bunch of stuff that you have to do. Write this in sort of space, sort of that. All right, do this again. T1, it's bracket. I need to try to write small here. All right, three Kelvin all to the fourth power. Minus. All right, okay, that is negative 3.80 times 10 to the 26 watts times, okay, I have one 
over all of this. So Stefan Boltzmann constant, 5.67 times 10 to the negative eight joules per second meter squared Kelvin to the fourth. The emissivity is a perfect black body, that's 1.0. And the area of the sun, I'm given a 7 point, watch, I gotta figure that out, don't I? Hang on one second. The area of the sun, we need to figure that one out. That's gonna be, the surface area of a sphere is for pi r squared, with r is the radius. All right, so that's going to be 4 pi. We have 7.00 times 10 to the 8th meters. That's the radius of the sun. Square that. And when you do that, you find out that's going to be 6.16 times 10 to the 18th meters squared. All right, I guess it's back here. So that's 6.16, it's in the space I know, times 10 to the 18th meters squared. All right, all of that. And remember, well, that's got to be to the one fourth power. Right. So that's a lot. All right. So again, I had to calculate the surface area of a sphere. A sphere of radius r. We're given the radius of the sun. We're assuming it's a sphere. A sphere of radius r. Well, the surface area. That's it. That's the area of all around the entire sphere. The surface area because the sun radiates in all possible directions, all possible thetas and thetas, all possible directions. So, so again, the power that's radiated is over the surface area of a sphere. Again, this is the surface area of a sphere. Is the area through which radiation is transferring. The thing is, when you when you when you talk about what you put for a, the answer is what is the area through which through which electromagnetic radiation is uh, passing. You know, in some cases it may be a flat plate, in other cases it's different. In the case of a star, like the like the sun, it is if you assume that it is a sphere, it radiates through the entire sphere. The nuclear reaction radiates energy through the sphere. Was called isotropically. Isotropically means in all directions. So the area that you have to consider is the surface area of the sphere itself. So I stick here. That's the surface area. So again, T1 becomes T2 to the fourth. That's the three column space minus. Unit number T, we're told the sun radiates towards it. Negative 3.0 and 26 watts. And then 1 divided by sigma EA, sigma step on Boltzmann constant. We're told that the sun's a perfect black body. So its emissivity is 1.0. And this is the surface area of the sphere. Okay? So in sodium, I'm going to erase this now. Let's write what the temperature of the sun is. So finally, T1. When you do this calculation, you find out that T1 is equal to 5740 Kelvin. It's about the scientifically accepted value for the temperature of the sun. 5740 Kelvin, temperature of the sun. You're not going to put a thermometer in the sun. You're going to you have to find a temperature another way. But well, here's a way to do it by knowing other things. All right, part B. Part B asks, well, specifically it says, um, how much power does the sun radiate per square meter on its surface? All right, well, what we have. We know what Q over T is. We know what the power radiated is. We need to know the intensity. All right. So we want the intensity at its actual surface. Right? So I'm going to reset this. We're going to look at. It. So this was all of this was part A, by the way. All of this was A. Okay. We're about to look at part B. All right. So part B. Let me erase all the rest of the stuff. So we want power. We want we want the power radiated per meter squared, or the intensity. So we want the intensity which is Q net over T divided by an area, okay? Again, that's the, we want the power radiated per meter squared at the surface of the sun. Well, there you go. Now, by, um, uh, by, by some serendipity, you know, the way this problem uh, works out, where we actually did calculate the surface area of the sun. So you want the power radiated per area? Well, you'll just divide that Q net over D divided by the area we just calculated earlier. That is, you're asking the power radiated per square meter per area, otherwise known as the intensity uh, at the surface of the sun. So we, we do this. Um, we simply will write down that that's going to be, um, again, we're not worried about science here. So we're just going to say 3.80 times 10 to the 26 watts. That is the power radiated isotropically from the sun. And then per for what, uh, for what square area? Well, intensity always has, has to have an area. So again, you're talking about surface area of the sun. We just talked about that a, a few seconds ago. That was 6.16 times 10 to the 18th meter square. We find that the intensity for part, part B is simply going to be 6.17 times 10 to the seventh watts per meter square. That is extreme intensity. You do not want to be anywhere near the sun. Very, very, very intense. All right, so again, if you're a planet that's close to Mercury, Mercury's going to have very, very high intensity. The intensity that a planet receives is officially called the solar constant. Okay, I'll mention that we're going to copy the solar constant for the Earth in part C. So that's the intensity. This is the intensity at the surface, at the surface of the sun. 
Now for part C, we're going to calculate intensity at a distance of the, the Earth's distance. All right, so that's part C. Let's do that. Now. That's all this two part B, part C. Now for intensity calculations like this, this is pretty much what you have to do. So you, you have the sun, you know, in the, in the middle here. This is your sun. Way off yonder is the Earth. So let's say the Earth is up here. And they should not be the same size, but anyway, don't worry about size distance here. Um, but there is a, a distance, a center to center distance, we'll call it R. Okay, in this case, R um, is actually going to be, I'll call it R1 to not, get, to not have it confused with the radius of the sun. So this R1 is the distance between the sun, between the sun and the Earth. What I want to do is I know that the power is radiating isotropically. I know it radiates uniformly in all directions. Every direction, every theta and phi in space gets the same kind of, in, same kind of amount of power. So what I want to think about is, you know, when I talk about intensity is how much, how's the power being captured per unit area over a sphere at the Earth-Sun distance? I want to draw a sphere all the way around the, um, around the, basically the Earth-Sun distance, draw a sphere. And then what I want to do is I want to figure out how much power is being rated per unit area of large sphere that's at the Earth-Sun distance. That's going to be the solar constant because that's how far away the Earth is. Okay, so that's, so that's part of what I want to do. I want to consider an area of a sphere that is very, very large. In fact, the radius of that sphere about the sun is the distance between the Earth and the sun. And figure out how much power lands per sphere on this larger sphere. Okay, so this is not capturing very well here. All right, so with that said, let's, uh, it's the same, pretty much the same calculation. I have a larger surface area, a larger sphere. The surface we're going to call it A1. It'll be four pi R1 squared. A1 will be four pi. This time is the distance from the sun to the earth. Okay, so that's going to be one five to the eleventh meters. And so this surface area of the larger sphere, the one that's, that, you know, that's basically the radius of the earth, I'm sorry, the, the, back, the distance between the sun and the earth, that size, that radius, calculated to be 2.83 times 10 to the 23rd meter squared. All right, so I'm going to figure out the power of that radius through that sphere. All right, and so well, what's the intensity? The intensity at this particular level, q over t, divided by a1. All right, so that's going to be, I mean, again, the sun's going to radiate the same amount of power, but it's going to be the 3.80 times 10 to the 26 watts, divided by 2.83 times 10 to the 23rd meter squared. And I will find out that the intensity of the sun, the intensity of sunlight landing on the Earth, at least landing on a on a sphere of the radius equal to the Earth's sun distance will be 1340 watts per meter squared. Typically, that value varies because of cloud covers and so on. We refer to this as a solar constant. Typically, the number I remember usually is 1400. 1340 is pretty close. I guess this is what we normally call the solar constant. That is roughly the amount of power per unit area, roughly the intensity that Earth or any other planet would feel at this distance. This is a 1.5 seven meters to 93 million miles. Now we refer to that as a solar constant. All right, so, so again, this is a much more livable number than the previous, the previous number. The number we calculated before was 6.17 times 10 to the 7th, 61.7 million watts per meter squared. I mean, that's, that number would be, would be massively intense. This number is the one we live on. And, and again, you know, this, it is you know, part of the reason why the Earth has life and that this value is not too large. You, know, you don't want a value so large that it bakes the planet. At the same time, you also don't want a value so small that there's not enough sunlight. So this is a this is a good value for the sustenance of life. All right. So with that, um, I will uh, say that this is the conclusion of the uh, chapter 13 lecture on uh, heat transfer.